Welcome back to Neon Galactic, a YouTube podcast produced by PBS affiliate Keat TV in Eureka, California. I'm your host, James Falk. Thanks for joining us. Author and professor Jeffrey Kripal has easily been one of the most prominent and passionate advocates for expanding the accepted vocabulary of human experience. He's written a number of fantastic books, and one of his recent volumes, The Flip, captures exactly that experience that I've been most interested in covering on, that sh on this show, that moment when an individual realizes that what they've long accepted as the boundaries of the real are only as permanent and inflexible as our thinking. Magic is all around us, in other words, depending on whether we're willing to open our eyes. We as a species pretend we're on a steady and rising trajectory of progress, slowly but surely transcending the illusions of the past in favor of a logical, systematic vision of reality that depends only on physical laws and fundamental particles to make the world. We forget that any system designed by humans to aid in understanding the cosmos will always only tell part of the story, and that as long as we're ignorant of what's getting left out, our resolution of reality will remain endlessly myopic. Mystery, as a result, is alive and well, while intellectual humility could in fact be our savior. From the archives of the impossible at Rice University, where Jeffrey is the J. Newton Razor Professor of Religion, to the newly formed Soul Foundation, which is angling to make UAPs and NHI a respected film uh, or field of academic inquiry and corporate investment, Jeffrey is working hard to help this species accept the numinous and visionary as an important and formative part of what it means to be human. Thanks for coming on the show, Jeffrey. Yeah, thanks for having me again, James. <laughs> Um, I know you're busy, so we'll uh, try to be efficient about this. Um, one of the reasons why I was drawn to you, as uh, are most people who are interested in this topic, um, you're, you're a thought leader, I think, in trying to uh, wrestle with um, these issues and figure out what's um, at stake in, in the nature of reality. Um, you are working to help people take more seriously the visionary experiences of humanity and figure out how to embed those in a modified but more inclusive worldview. What would you say um, the value is in that? Uh, well, I, th I think our, our science and technology can do a lot and we can make a lot of cool stuff, but what it leaves out is us. And that's a big hole. That, that's a huge hole. And it happens to be the hole we inhabit. <laughs> um, so I think the worldview that we get out of that particular way of knowing is ultimately dep a depressing one and, and a nihilistic one, by which I mean it, it's without meaning or goal or purpose. And I think human beings suffer uh, intensely because of that worldview and often not even knowing why. Um, so I think the the stakes are extremely high. And I think intellectuals and academics and scientists and thought, thought leaders, as you put it, um, podcasters, media, I think we're all responsible mm -hmm. for this worldview that we're building or that we're assuming. Uh, and I think it I think it does real damage to people. And I think other forms of worldview can can do real good. Um, and it's not that our worldview is completely bad. I'm not suggesting that. Um, I just think every worldview does certain things really well and other things really poorly. And I want us to do those things we do really poorly a lot better. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that um, people often talk about is that sense of alienation that comes from looking at things in a mechanis mechanistic or, you know, logical positivist way or, or whatever. Right. Um, do you think, how much would you credit that for, a lot of the conundrums that we're facing right now in terms of social problems and economic divide, all those sorts of things. How much, how much do those tie in together? Well, they totally tie in. I, I, I think our, our sense of meaninglessness and, and being without a rudder is entirely a function of our mechanistic worldview. I, I think, I think we are without a rudder. Um, I think that that's just being honest. That's not being particularly insightful or prophetic. Um, I also think, you know, this isn't often said, but a lot of our, our most pressing problems are actually created by science and technology. Um, global climate change and climate catastrophe are entirely driven by human activity. 
and human ingenuity, by the way, and human technology, by the way. And um, so I don't, I think science and technology, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, it, it helps us in some ways and really hurts us in others. And that's before we get to things like nuclear, nuclear war or, you know, um, capitalism run amok or, or whatever you want to talk about. I mean, these are all functions of science and technology, I think, at the end of the day. And, and so I think we have to really struggle with that. One of the things that, um, you know, when I was interviewing, for instance, Bernardo Castrop uh, earlier on one of my earlier episodes, um, his books talk about how the only real ontological primitive that we can be absolutely sure of is that we have an internal uh, experience, experiential space, right? And in the inside of our heads and everything is determined by what we experience through that space. So the idea of a division between subjective and objective is problematic from the start because no matter what we do or what systems metrics we set up, we're always going to be in the realm of the subjective, but our sciences and our, uh, a lot of our philosophers are now telling us that subjective is not even real. How do we, uh, you know, I mean, how do we begin to make people take more seriously um, the subjective experiences of other folks if they're not having those experiences themselves? Well, first of all, most people are having those experiences. Yes. I, I, I think our, our sense that they're rare is a complete illusion. Uh, and it's completely a, it's it is a function of this worldview that suppresses and takes off the table particular kinds of experiences. I mean, even to call them subjective is to dismiss them. Yeah. Uh, because our worldview, you know, works through this separation of the sub subject subject and the object. And of course, the objective is what is real and stable, and the subjective is what is unreal and and unstable. And so we've already set the rules for dismissal. Um, and I think the other thing we can do that that is just natural and easy is we just listen to our our family members and listen to ourselves. And when they tell us they had some kind of extraordinary experience, we don't dismiss it. By which I mean, we don't reduce it to something we think we know it's oh it was a hallucination or oh it was an anecdote or oh there are all these sort of rhetorical devices people use to dismiss the extraordinary experience and to return the world to to one's own sort of banal explanations and i think that's tragic yeah. um i i think human beings are extraordinary i think they have these experiences all the time and i think to the extent we say they don't happen we're just we're just being dishonest. Um, and, and all the easy rhetorical tricks, none of them are actually true, by the way. People are not making this up. They're not lying. They're not, they're not out for money or fame. Um, they're, they're, they're being honest and they're trying to, to explain what happened to them the best they can. And often they themselves, James, are not this is something I really want to stress. They themselves are not the authority of their experiences. Sure. In other words, they don't know what happened, you know, and nor do you, nor do I, nor does the the so-called expert or the the skeptic. They they certainly don't know. And so to claim knowledge here, I think, is 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 a problem. I mean, you use the word mystery in your in your introductory remarks. I'm not proposing some kind of vague mystery i'm just saying let look let's be really clear and humble about what we know and what we can know and what we don't know and can't know yeah and and let's 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 be clear about that and let's not continue to bullshit one another which is what we've been doing i think um to to construct a particular worldview that is very good again at doing certain things but is very bad at at providing meaning or purpose or 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 um, any kind of worldview that's that's useful or, or or meaningful to a human being. Yeah. Well, when I was referencing mystery in the intro, part of what uh, makes me think uh, in that line was something you had talked about before in our last interview, which was the sort of the disenchantment of the universe and the reenchantment of the universe, and whether or not what we're going through now is sort of that process. And for me, uh, I find great. Um, 
thrill in the fact that we may not know everything and that there are things in the universe that at this moment at least are beyond our our understanding so that there's something further to strive for you know um and so uh, on that level i enjoy the mystery um but but i understand what you were saying there one of the things also that um, happens a lot is that there have been a series of books uh, that have come out sort of equating um, developments in quantum physics, for example, or other sciences and saying, aha, here we have modern um, uh, you know, materialistic science starting to confirm some of the, the lessons of the Vedas or some of the you know, more perennial philosophy sort of oriented stuff. But then others, critics often say, well, that's, you know, abusing the science and trying to find ways to, through the back door to get, you know, religion or dogma back into the, the conversation. Um, do you see that, that that convergence happening? And do you think there's a risk in looking at science and saying, well, if that's true, then maybe, you know, the idea of the universe as mind might be true or some of the other leaps that people take uh, naturally, I think. But what do you think the risk is there? Is there one? I think I think there is a risk, but I think it's worth taking. Um, I you know I'm of the opinion. So I'm not of of course a physicist or more much less a quantum theorist, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of physicists and I know a lot of quantum theorists. And what what they essentially are saying is that we need a culture and a worldview that can take in the insights of quantum physics, and we don't have one. We don't have one right now. You're absolutely right. We. The, we need artists and novelists and writers and visionaries to give us a new language and to give us a new set of metaphors that make sense of quantum physics as as a culture. And that's a that's a very relevant um, and meaningful exercise. The early, you know, you've probably heard me say the early quantum physicists all turned to mystical literature. They exactly turned, right. Yeah, they turned there instantly because yeah. they saw instantly that the paradoxes and the unities and the entanglements of quantum physics were all in the historical record and in the, in the human experience. Now, are those things the same? I don't know. I, I mean, one's from the inside and one's from the outside, so they're not the same. But if the world is one, and, and James, I really do think it's one, they actually have to connect. Yeah. If, if mystical experience is an experience of reality, and quantum physics is uh, a mathematical approximation or description of reality from the outside, then they better darn well match yeah. at some point. So I don't think that's irrelevant at all. Um, I think we have to be careful and not draw identities. I don't think the mystics are saying the same thing as the quantum physicists or vice versa. Um, the other thing I'll say is, this is a little more um, theoretical, but it's it's very um, I think it's very relevant here. I my goal is to keep things on the table, and and when I talk about the impossible, what I mean is things that are ha happening all the time for which we don't have any theoretical models, and so we say, oh, those can't happen. Well, they do happen. So obviously, our theoretical models are wrong, um, and so what quantum the, the advantage of a lot of quantum mechanical ideas is that they give us a theoretical model in which these things are no longer so impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, might they be wrong? Absolutely. Is there a connection? We don't know. Is it still useful to try? Yes. Um, and so I'm, I'm just betting that um, cultural makers, creative people need to think with quantum physics just, just as well, and maybe more so than the quantum physicists. It's not just for the scientists. Um, I think the same is true of evolutionary biology, the same is true of neuroscience, the same is true of anything we come to know with certainty uh, or, it, or some level of certainty. We need to integrate that into our culture and our worldview. And it's up to others to do that, um, not, not the scientists. Yeah, I think part of accepting what, you know, that stuff into the worldview is telling the true story about people's experience with this kind of stuff. And um, it, as I've learned um, by reading Diana Pasolka and others, and then going back into some of the mystical literature of the past 500 years, there have always been people who think that they are in contact with another form of intelligence. And right. often those people are the most brilliant and innovative minds among us. 
Um, I mean, Diana Pasolka has a, you know, a, a range of people who are right on the forefront of several different fields. And um, you talk about, you know, Emanuel Swedenborg or, um, you know, Paracelsus, I, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, those people were in communication with something that was giving them inspiration that led to a lot of their discoveries or um, their deductions about the nature of reality. I mean, I don't, I guess I'm asking, why is that so difficult to accept when the information these people are given are, are, is, uh, you know, um, verifiable. It, it proves its uh, accuracy by nature of what it's achieving. And yet we still want to pretend like it's either, I mean, at best, it's some part of their subconscious where it's, you know, grokking things behind the scenes or whatever. I think, I think the problem is, well, there's a couple, there's a couple of real issues here that I think are, are entirely legitimate. One is that these are altered states that are not transmissible mm -hmm. to other people. They're not, they're not actually replicable. So, you know, and, al and also the phenomena, it, the phenomena itself of someone like Swedenborg or Paris, all of these, these characters, they're, they're coded. You know, if, if you actually read Swedenborg, I mean, I personally don't, I don't like a lot of what he has to say. Um, I don't hold the angels in the heaven and the whole thing. I mean, I'm like, come on, that that's a previous pre-modern worldview. So I think whatever was being communicated to him was being coded in the terms of the culture and the time. Exactly and, right. We, yes. <laughs> and I, I think the same is true of, of, frankly, the scientists that Diana is working with, many of whom I know personally. Yeah. I, and I... I, I talk to them and I I try to explain to them that, you know, some of these phenomena that, that they, they're, they're experiencers too, by the way. This is the other thing to say. Scientists are not uh, uh, bodiless uh, heads, you know, floating around. They, they have bodies and they're in cultures and they're human beings and they have children and they have lovers and they have partners and wives and husbands and they're people too. Yeah. And because of that, they have these experiences. They're experiencers too. Mm -hmm. um, and what I try to explain to them is, look, you you actually need to talk to a humanist or a historian or a, or a scholar of religion to understand what happened to you. It's, your science isn't sufficient here. Um, and you know, they listen. They do they really do listen, James. I, I'm not sure they listen enough. Um, I, I'm always, I always think we need to hire or or employ more historians and humanists. By the way, be, because our culture needs them desperately. We don't, we don't, we don't need more more of the the same. We need we need a new we need a new route actually. And I think that that path is is well worn in the past, but it's it's fairly rare in the present. And we're dismissing and. We're dismissing and and criticizing people today, or particularly humanist historians, for their critical theories, which which are very important. But it's not the entirety of those disciplines. Um, you know, the critical the critical theories around race and gender and sexuality and and history are integral to those disciplines. But there's also this vertical dimension. There's also this sort of transcendent dimension that that is also part of these disciplines and also part of these canons or these literatures that we keep, we throw the baby out with the bath water. And we, we should, we shouldn't even throw the bath water out, by the way, we should be in, we should be listening to all of these things because these are honest people talking again um, and really trained and really smart people. It's interesting. You know, that's I think humanists, lot. that's a lot. That's a lot. I'm sorry. I sort no, of, I love it. it. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. That's exactly what I, what I wanted you to come on here and talk about in the manner I wanted you to talk about it. <laughs> um, but it seems like humanists um, in the, the universities are at times the most allergic to these subjects because yeah. they are yeah. already accused of being you know, soft yeah. and woo-woo and about feelings yeah. and stuff. And that is not quantifiable. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of things. Um, so where would you say the humanities have failed um, on this topic, and how do they begin to create room within their, you know, studies for this without sort of confirming to their critics their worst, you know, fears or, so, or whatever? 
So first of all, the, the worst fears of the critics are correct. Uh, <laughs> you know, humanists are a dangerous lot. And um, I actually like that. I'm like, yeah, hey, at least they, they're afraid of us now. I mean, that's, that's an advance, by the way. Um, but I also think, and, and I've written about this in a book called The Superhumanities. I think the humanities have dug their own grave, essentially. Um, and I think to the extent we reduce the human to this sort of social animal, we we have written our own um, our own epitaph, yeah, our own ep obituary. And I and I think I, I don't think I know that the a lot of the canon, a lot of the literature of the humanities that we revere was created through the altered states of the people who who wrote it, and so the. At the core of the humanities is what I call the superhumanities. It's really mm -hmm. these altered states. And if we talked about these, if we talked about Nietzsche, if we talked about Freud, if we talked about Hegel, if we talked about Anzal Dua, if we talked about Du Bois, if we talked about people as superhuman as well as human, I think we would have an audience. Uh -huh. um, but we don't. We just reduce everything to this flatland, and then we're like, "Well, why? Why is? Why are we being defunded? Why? Why are jobs going? Well, your jobs are going away because you're not saying anything. People also have this vertical dimension as well. They yeah. they, they go into these altered states, and and they have these ideas and these visions. And by the way, I think all the a lot of the great ideas of the humanities come from altered states. They don't come from logic and reason." They yeah. come from from the alteration of of consciousness and embodiment, and you know the other joke I tell James is, look, you know, last Halloween there were a lot of children at my door, and about two thirds of them were dressed up as superhumans. There was nobody dressed up as a professor of religion, <laughs> right? There there was nobody dressed up as a humanist, by the way, either. They were yeah. they were. There were there were over half of them were superhumans, and I'm like, what are we doing? This this is our stuff, you know. We know all about superhumanity. I mean, we we actually literally created that word, and um, the pop culture and the science fiction took it from us, by the way. So it's like, come on, just own own up to your own history and to your own essential coolness, and and let's let's. Let's get let's get people on board with this because it's really really exciting. And is it critical? Absolutely. Is it transcendent and affirmative? Absolutely. Uh, it's all those things at once. Yeah. You know, um, I came from the, the uh, humanities. I'm an English major, uh, so I'm very familiar with a lot of the discussions that went on um, in terms of uh, you know critical theory and that sort of thing. Um, and I find I found myself at times uncomfortable with it, um, and I felt like that there was an overemphasis on identity. Yeah, um, I you know that's a huge subject for folks right now, and I understand that you know recognizing the the identity and res respecting it of the identity of um, each individual person is important on a, on a social level. But like you like you were saying, it sort of flattens everything out, and it doesn't allow for um, you know transcendent collective kinds of experiences and as a result I, it's like we're bifurcating ourselves and we're ignoring a, a big part of our um our, our nature how do we begin to i mean and it's it, it's complicated because it's not something that you want to reverse i mean you don't want to go back to a place where we're not doing that but you want to include some of those experiences that are more pan human um how do we open that conversation, especially when things have become so politicized around identity right now. Well, again, I don't want to go around critical theory. I don't, I don't yeah. want to deny it. I want to go through it. Yeah. And I think the answer is to recognize that, that some take justice, for example, justice is a combination of, of radical difference and radical sameness. You know, you don't get one without the other. You don't get justice by just affirming difference. If something's completely different than me, I eat it, by the way. Um, if something is sim is very different from me, but is also very similar to me, I treat it with a lot of respect and and it's sim simply different. So I, I, I personally think that a lot of our values presume this unity 
but we, for some reason, we're in a period, and maybe it's necessary. Maybe there's a necessary period we go through where we need to emphasize and only talk about difference. But I think we're past that, James. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we see the dysfunction of that. We see the where that goes, and it's time now not to reverse or not to not to reverse the clock, but to push it forward and say, okay, now we emphasize both. We don't just say one or the other. I think we we erred uh, on the side of of sameness and and frankly a, a kind of white sameness, a white male sameness, a white European male sameness. And now we know that that's that that was an error, and yeah. and we need to affirm radical human difference, but we also need to affirm radical human unity because people have both experiences and. Yeah. Uh, they're both true. They're both real, um, and we need we need them to build a world in which people are affirmed in their differences, but also exist in a in a larger community, a larger global community. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the 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 white male sameness, and there's a feeling among a lot of folks that any uh, um, reaching out for a collective kind of identity is that and that doesn't have to necessarily be the case uh i don't think that's true actually i you know i mean obviously i'm a white male i mean i here i am <laughs> um, so i can see that someone's saying that uh, on the other hand there are a lot of people who are not white and who are not male and who are not heterosexual by the way who are also affirming human unity yeah. so i i just don't buy that i just i just think that's that's dysfunctional again, and it's a great way to 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 end a discipline or or a way of thinking about the world. Um, and it's ra rather fear based, which I think uh, you know often leads to what seem like philosophical or intellectual um, dead ends. Yeah. To get at the nature of what's going on, which is always my favorite topic, and a lot of my listeners, I think you know. Um, we talk about Swedenborg, we talk about all these uh, high functioning scientists and others who have been uh, inspired or gifted by some form of intelligence or the collective or whatever, whatever it might be. To your mind, what does that say that we're getting these messages that this thing is communicating with us? I mean, Charles Fort famously said, we are property, you know, that we are, uh, um, that somehow we're being manipulated and maybe it's to something else's ends, but we can't recognize that from our aquarium situation. Um, what do you uh, think? Are we being manipulated and, and to what end? What are your thoughts on what may be at play? So, yeah, that's a complicated question. So I, th I think the, the answer is, is the conversation, James. I, I don't, I certainly don't have an answer to that. But I think if you put a lot of smart people together over many generations, you're going to get a conversation that is going to push that question forward and, 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 and come to some, maybe not conclusions, but come to some general patterns or general assumptions about things. Are we being manipulated? I mean, certainly the, the strange experiences that, that, I, that I study and, and live with and, and listen to are primarily deceptive. Um, so whatever is engaging us in these experiences, <laughs> it's not telling the truth, um, to, to be frank about it, but nor are we, um, I mean, my, my metaphor is always when I wake up in the morning and, and, and remember a dream, I don't know what the hell it was about. Uh, so some part of me is essentially lying or, or speaking in code to another part of me. I'm split right down the middle. I'm deceptive with myself. I'm censoring myself. So when someone has these kinds of experiences and they're coded or they're in they're not they're not what they seem to be, that doesn't surprise me. Um, but it it does it does worry me, I suppose. I but I also think that that split in us is is partly a product of of our social imaginary and the way we have split ourselves. Essentially, we keep imagining that we're other than the environment, for example, or we're I'm different than you, or or however we imagine this. And I think that that's deeply mistaken on on some basic level. So that kind of split doesn't doesn't surprise me. I also want to say deception isn't necessarily bad. 
Um, I deceive um, our 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 pet dog Delilah every day every time I take her to the veterinarian. Yeah. Um, but I don't intend harm to her. I intend good things for her. We deceive our children. We uh, religious teachers deceive their flocks in the sense they don't believe what they're saying often. Um, sometimes they do, you know, I, I grant, I grant that, but sometimes they don't. So I don't think, and we know that deception in the natural environment is a sign of intelligence. Mm -hmm. We know that organisms camouflage themselves both to hide, but also to prey on things, right? So camouflage and deception is not necessarily bad. And it's also not a sign of, of stupidity. It's a sign of intelligence, actually. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So when I say that these things are deceptive and that we're not authorities of our own experience, I don't mean that in a bad or negative sense. I'm just trying to acknowledge what the case is. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Does that help? I don't know if that no, helps. Oh, yeah, it, it does. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned earlier was that, you know, um, depending on what our cultural milieu may be, that's that may help define what we're experiencing, because the phenomenon or this intelligence or, or whatever it may be is speaking in a language that we can sort of understand and that can get the point across. Um, you know, obviously. So then my my question is, would you see UFOs from balls of light to, you know, physical metallic looking craft in the sky do they represent that same kind of phenomenon and then i guess i want to ask as a follow-on to that has the rate of that changed i mean does it seem like the message is getting more urgent from from the phenomenon or has it always been kind of static and part of us so first of all i want to be humble here and not not in a pious or moral sense, but in a in a cognitive sense, mm -hmm. I don't think human beings are have evolved to understand their entire environment. I, I think we have evolved to basically kill things and reproduce and flourish in a biological sense, but certainly we have not evolved to know reality as it really is. Um, and other people have said that better than I have. Um, in terms of the UFO phenomena that you're referring to, I, I think it's a grab bag. I think th there's a lot of things in that trash can, essentially, that we call UFO. And and I don't want to reduce them to, I don't want to reduce it all to my own training and say, oh, it's, it's some kind of presence or consciousness speaking in the code of the culture. That sounds a lot like what a historian of religions would say. And <laughs> I... I I w I am challenged and and changed by these experiencers, and I don't want to claim some explanation of their experience. So, when they, for example, tell me that no, this was a physical being that entered my room and sat on me, as it were, I I take that seriously. I I don't I, I don't have an answer for that other than a physical being entered your room and, and was on top of you. Okay, I, I get that. Now, does that make any sense in our present worldview? No. But does that mean it didn't happen? No. Um, so I guess what I am trying to say is I am deeply suspicious of anybody who has an explanation for this stuff because what they're doing is they're reducing it to their own worldview. And, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you a simple example here from my own area there's this sort of rhetorical funny question about whether you should baptize an alien or not. <laughs> and the answer is no, you should not baptize an alien. That's my answer. And the yeah. reason is, first of all, it won't let you baptize it. But second of all, by baptizing it, what you're really doing is just reaffirming your own religious worldview and you're returning right. it to you. And I think that's a mistake. I think the reason these things are happening to the people they're happening to is to shock them out of their their worldview and this and the the cultural story that they're embedded in. Um, now, 
Are they happening more today than in the past? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. And again, I suspect that the rarity of, of these occurrences is a pure illusion and a function of the social censorship and not a function of how many times or how often or how extensively they happen. Um, so I'm I'm skeptical of the it's happening more now. I, I think the, the cultural uptake changes. I think we're more serious now about them and we can hear more we can more seriously consider these possibilities today than we could 10 years ago. But does that mean that the phenomenon itself is, or the phenomena themselves are lesser or less frequent? I, I doubt it. I doubt it seriously. Um, I, I personally think we've been interacting with other forms of consciousness for millennia. It, right. probably tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions of years I, I i suspect it's it's as old as as we are um and i also suspect james at the end of the day that it's frankly us um and the reason i say that is it sure looks like us uh it sure sounds like us you know something can't speak telepathically to you unless it's you yeah. <laughs> on some level um so what does that mean? Well, I don't yeah. know what that means, James. It, yeah. I don't mean it's James or it's Jeff or it's sure. you know American or Chinese or Russian or anything. I just mean it's somehow human-like and it's drawing moral distinctions and it's communicating with us in a way that suggests very strongly to me that it shares some kind of interest in our in our species, probably because it is our species. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the great questions, you know, I mean, like we look at the, how the figures that are often experienced are anthropomorphic or the way they're communicating, what they're communicating. They often seem to be, if not human, human adjacent. <laughs> and, um, you know, that it's like, is it uh, actually us as in just a part of our own species or is it something that's symbiotic with us that depends upon us that is, you know, uh, involved in some sort of a, a give and take that we may not recognize, but may be fundamental to um well, either again, reality you know, or our being yeah if, if so if i were if i had the ability to travel through space and time you know kind of effortlessly mm -hmm. i would be very concerned about my own species and i would be really concerned about when that species started to essentially juggle chainsaws you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's discovered radiation, for example, I would be like, oh, oh, that's that's a problem. And so, you know, I think the the mythology that develops around that is is relevant because it 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 does suggest some kind of intervention. Um, but the other thing I notice, you know, and, and again, this is just noticing this. I when I look at something like Skinwalker Ranch, say, with the sort of you ranch in utah that seems to be super haunted well whatever that thing is uh, it's it melts dogs to goo but it doesn't melt any humans by the way and it's so it's drawing moral distinctions yeah. and and um and you know we can make of that what we will um uh, but i i i think again it's somehow human or or non we can call it non-human which essentially means it's not us uh, you know there are social egos but yeah. i think it's still it's still very much related to us otherwise it wouldn't be communicating with it wouldn't care frankly uh about about it why would it care about us yeah, yeah exactly we would just be bugs like the th three body problem um has been saying yeah. there, there's a, there's there's a meditation on the on the issue there too you know i mean i think yeah. science fiction is is a, is a long meditation on this problem you know or yeah. on this question yeah and almost a um uh you know and a deep and internal uh wrestling with the issues like even though we're not ready to put it in our sciences and our universities on a subconscious level we're all uh, captivated and uh, grokking it as best we can and we yeah. go to different fiction representations to sort of try it on for size, kind of, and see what it feels like to live in that universe. You know, um, one of the movies I talk a lot about is Arrival. And the reason I love to talk about Arrival is it, it, it breaks with what I call the Cold War invasion narrative. 
You know, yeah. we we tend to imagine the UFO or the, or the the phenomena as somehow it's invading our our sacred, holy American airspace from the outside, and our job is to fight it off, to fight it back. Yeah. You know, what we don't often realize is is that that's a that's a Cold War narrative. It's a Cold mm -hmm. War story. It's a Cold War fear. Um, and that even something like War of the Worlds was a a colonial or anti colonial novel uh, about the British who were overwhelming um, populations that weren't as technologically advanced as they were. Yeah. And what Arrival does, if you if you really watch it, is the military is present in it, but it actually doesn't do anything. Yeah. And the whole thing hinges on this idea that the alien presence actually needs the human presence yeah. in, the, in the far future. And so there's something about human beings that, that is very special. There's, of course, also something very special about the alien presence, but they're somehow connected. And the whole film revolves around communication. Yeah, yeah. Between these, these two species. And I think that's a much healthier kind of meditation on the problem than, you know, let's blow the thing up kind of. That's not a meditation. That's a... That's yeah. A, that's a Cold War response. That's just, it's stupid. It's really stupid and dangerous. Especially when, I mean, any civilization, if it come across, you know, vast interstellar spaces, it's not going to have a problem dealing with whatever our technology uh, yeah, you know, would be. <laughs> the other thing I know, I know as a historian is that when one culture that's technologically superior interacts with the one that is not, it's not a good story. It's not yeah. good for the... Yeah. the the technologically uh, less advanced culture. So, you know, one of the reasons I don't like the language of threat and the science and security narrative is that if, if, if these things are even remotely, if these stories are even remotely accurate, we would have been toast a long time ago if, yeah. if these are really after us. There's We have nothing. We have no way of not even close james not even close and so the whole threat narrative just doesn't impress me or move me because i'm like well we, we would have been gone hundreds of thousands of years ago i mean this is nutty you know yeah this is a reflection of us again of exactly our own, right of our own violence of our own uh, hatred of the other, of our own fear of the trauma other. and history that we've put on each other. Yeah, absolutely. So we keep basically like any of the theories that seem to confirm what we're doing or what we fear is what we want to focus on because that just allows us to keep going in the on the you know trajectory that we're on rather than wrestling with what might be real difference and an opportunity to find something transcendent in our Un you know. unless you listen to the anthropologists and the historians and the humanists, then you'll do the latter. You're like, oh, uh oh, you know. I yeah. mean, I mean, when a historian <laughs> or a humanist listens to some of these stories, we're we're just shaking our heads. It's just like, yeah. oh my god, we've heard that one so many times, and it doesn't end well. Please stop it. And um, but people just don't listen to us. Yeah, it, it sells. You know, I mean, whether it's fear and people get worked up by that and they like that getting worked up, I mean, or governments do because it makes their populations easier to control. Not to say that there's some grand informational conspiracy, but I think that there is an awareness of that. And, uh, you know, I would not doubt that it's being used yeah. to some extent. I think so. I, I, I know some of these these uh, ex-military people and I some of the political actors and I think their their hearts actually are in a good place, but my my sense is is that they don't, you know. There's this notion of disclosure that there's somehow there's some there's some government agency that somehow knows and and is I I just don't believe that James. I I think what's being hidden is vast ignorance, yeah. and we don't have the capacity to deal with forms of intelligence that are not are not um organic or or carbon based or 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 us and so we say oh it doesn't exist or oh it's it's a secret well maybe it's a, it maybe this maybe it's a secret just because we're not we're not put together to understand it 
And this is where, again, your comment on mystery, I think is very relevant. I mean, it, that's a very healthy attitude um, to, to not knowing. Uh, yeah. And we have, by the way, we have ways of not knowing in our past that are very effective and, and very much part of our cultures, but we don't, we don't access them. What would be um, an example of that? Uh, apophatic mystical literature, which okay. which is essentially mystical literature that says away all of our notions of objectivity and subjectivity, and and all of our notions of God as some kind of external deity. Um, yeah. You know, somebody like Plotinus or or Meister Eckhart or Shankara or you know Dogen or I mean, there's so many figures in the history of religions that I think could be very helpful here. Um, but we we keep going back to what is essentially a demonology or an angelology. We're we're fascinated by invisible entities messing with us, but we don't we don't want to move beyond them into these higher realms where um, we're actually no different from from deity or from from the the universe itself. Um, and all this stuff is 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 sort of irrelevant at that point. Yeah. And it, yet we're, it seems like we're being beckoned in that direction, you know? Um, I think so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, the book, your book, The Flip, which I was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I mean, you mentioned in the beginning that it's a short book. Um, it is, I, I guess, rather short, but it just hits the nail so on the head with what my own experience is. And a lot of people I talk to about, um, you know, encountering this subject or something tangentially related to this subject and have it sort of uproots our lives and makes us uh, reassess everything and things that were previously closed as a subject suddenly, um, you know, bloom with a lot of things that prove to be much more fulfilling than anything that people have known before. Um, it also, I mean, it's interesting because like Diana Pasolka, uh, when she was first started talking about writing American Cosmic, she wanted to sort of focus on the fact that, you know, and I may be getting this wrong, so correct me if I am, but that ufology was sort of in some ways becoming religion-like. And so she wanted to chronicle that, that move. And it does seem like people who have been flipped sort of start to evangelize the flip, but not dogmatically, like mainly that, you know, it's like like the mystery, again, like embrace mystery, which I think is a, is a big part of it. My question is, is it a worthwhile or concrete goal to work on flipping society or is that going to happen of its own or not? I mean, how do we approach, should we evangelize this or or not? Yeah, so a couple of things I'll say that I can say lots of things, obviously. First, first of all, I think the way to go, this is going to sound self-serving, uh, but I, I think the way to go is education. Sure. Um, I don't think there's a quick, easy answer here. I think... And I, this is why I wrote the superhumanities because I think that the humanities themselves are are embedded with flips, and I don't think flipping is is accessible to everyone. By the way, James. However, the the good news or the flip the the flip side of that the good news of that is that um, these altered states or these flips are embedded in the literature, including literature, mm -hmm. and when sensitive human beings read that literature they themselves flip you yeah. know so is that is can we flip a whole culture no um should we flip a whole try no we shouldn't try um but can we flip elements of the culture yes and the flip itself is a book now i mean it it, it focuses almost entirely on scientists and engineers and medical professionals. And the reason I focused on them was, was there was a couple reasons. One was I work in a, in a very STEM oriented university and I became convinced pretty early on that my students were dismissing religious literature because they were thinking in their heads, oh, these people don't know their science. And if they just knew their science, they wouldn't say these stupid things. Yeah. So I said, I didn't say this to them. I said it to myself. Okay, I'm going to use Nobel laureates and chemists and secular atheists and I'm going to, medical professionals, and I'm going to I'm going to let them do the talking, and we're going to watch them flip, and then we're we're going to see how they 
they interpret their experiences. And it turns out they're just like, <laughs> they're just like the religious people. Um, and so, you know, basically I was trying to back my students into a corner and, and say, okay, now what, now what do you say? Yeah. Um, the other reason I wanted to use scientists and engineers and medical professionals is those are the, the priests of our, of our space. Yes, absolutely. They are the owners and the proponents of knowledge in this particular culture. And so when they speak, people listen. And I understand that. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's, um, I don't think it's adequate, by the way. I think it's, 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 it's essentially baloney. I think people who like, I think people like me who are not in the sciences or technology, I think we have just as much to say or more than, than the scientists or the engineers do, but it's okay. The, the, the culture will listen to a neurosurgeon and it won't listen to a historian. I, I get that. So th that's the reason I focused on those people. And the third reason was when they flipped, what these professionals realized is that their professions work just fine. Yeah, their, their science continued to be their science. Their medicine continued to be their medicine. Their architecture or their engineering continued to be their engineering. Um, but it was now animated or renewed with this conviction that the consciousness was not was not secondary. It was actually primary, yeah. and so the engineering or the science or the medicine then becomes a a kind of manifestation or projection of of consciousness, and consciousness is no longer just an epiphenomenon or a, a an accidental byproduct of of some kind of material process. Mm -hmm. So I there were a lot of things going on in that book um, that I, that I wanted to try to to tease out for people um but it's very much about scientists and engineers and and medical people um and yeah. some and, and some atheists too some some philosophers professional philosophers who who have certainly have no commitment to any particular religious worldview which is one thing i also valued about that in the book you talk about a certain kind of skepticism where some of these people who are having these experiences are the most skeptical of their own experiences not that they are acting like the, it didn't happen, but that they aren't attributing it to a dogma of any kind, and that they're more um, open about how they're trying to interpret those experiences against the backdrop of, you know, our collective human history or whatever. And I yeah. thought that was valuable. Yeah. I, you don't have to have a religious interpretation of these ex experiences. It's an interpretation. It's a spin on what's going on or what's what the what the flip is and the other thing i tried to say at the end of the book is having a flip doesn't make you moral by the way um there are a lot of flip people who are um, horrific human beings um so realizing that consciousness is primary and, and the material world is secondary is not the same as a moral code or or an, an ethical norm we we still have to argue ethics and 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 morality out. I think socially, uh, and and because it's very much about how we relate as as separate individuals. It's not about these experiences of unity or or or, or a flipped um, uh, idealism. Yeah. Now, one of the things that people often envision when they look at uh, you know an, an academic or uh, someone who's like you st you know you study religion is that there's this um, idea that you need to be apart from it, separate. You know, like have a uh, you know overhead view without getting involved in the details. And as we've discussed, you very much are um, you know expressing that there would there's value in taking these things seriously. Um, is there a risk there of being too partisan in this? Or, I mean, do you ever face that criticism? And if you do, how do you answer it? I mean, just a question. So, yeah, a couple things. Um, first of all, the notion of objectivity is a scientific value, right? It, 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 it implies this split between the unreal and unreliable subject and the reliable and the real object. And so the whole notion of objectivity, I, I don't buy. Um, on the other hand, I also don't want to be what people call subjective. I don't want to sign my name to a particular religious worldview or a belief system. Uh, and I don't, uh, or I try not to. And when I 
hold a set of assumptions and everybody does by the way nobody's truly objective yeah. nor should nor should you be by the way yeah. um i don't again i don't i don't accept the value system um i think everybody has ontological or metaphysical commitments including the people who say they don't they're yeah. the ones who who probably the most have committed some, most assumptions <laughs> yeah. um so when i i try to be very clear about what my ontological or metaphysical commitments or assumptions are, but they're just assumptions, James. They're not certainties. They're they're working assumptions that allow me to keep things on the table. And that's, to me, what counts. It's not whatever the theory is. It's whether the theory takes things off or puts things, or keeps things back, back on the table. Um, and that, to me, is a moral issue as well as, as, well as a philosophical issue. Um, I I I have no problem. I I mean I have friends who describe themselves as materialists, but you know they they uh, they write about things like precognition, and I'm like, that is so cool. I, I don't <laughs> frankly I don't frankly care what your your metaphysics is, as long as you keep this on the table, because obviously people are having this experience, and so to me yeah. again, it's 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 making sense of the experience that matters. It's not it's not one's own stated. Um, commitments yeah yeah and i value that uh, sort of radical open-mindedness about other people's experiences like you were saying earlier in the conversation we tend to if we have not had a similar visionary experience we just say it didn't happen or they're making it up or they're trying to get rich or whatever the excuse is but people aren't going to you know 90 percent of the time aren't going to come out and make some crazy claim that could impact their credibility in all kinds of ways unless they've actually had that experience and if they people are not telling the truth then they're in the vast majority vast minority and i think we'd all be better off taking people's testimony seriously about these kinds of things yeah i mean so you know i get asked this a lot and the question is usually framed in something like well have you been tricked or lied to and i'm like of course i mean yeah. so what i mean if, if you're going to get in the mud and you're going to get dirty, yeah, you know, so get dirty. And am I lied to or tricked commonly or often? No, no. And the reason James is, is fairly simple. It's that I don't actually work with people who perform on stage or who are required to do this over and over again. I work with people who are heavily traumatized and who have an experience, really a once in a lifetime experience. And yeah. I think they're telling me the truth and they're struggling with it because they don't understand what it means. And they're looking to me for help, maybe not to understand it, but to frame it in a way that, that makes sense. And I can definitely do the latter. I, I, I can't, really often do the former because I don't understand it either. Um, but but that that reliance on trauma and the spontaneous once in a lifetime experience protects me, I think, from a lot of the 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 trickster like nature yeah. or the fraudulent the fraudulence that is in fact a part of this this worldview or this 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 whole scene. I I really do want to acknowledge that. There's a lot of disinformation um, out there that that is intentional and it's meant to and it's human beings deceiving human beings by the way it's not it's not the phenomena i mean the phenomena itself is also deceptive but that's a whole nother la layer of, yeah. of deception here um yeah well and i think that any field of human endeavor has that I mean, there's always people who are, you know, manufacturing a story, whether or not it's about, you know, seeing something or, you know, uh, having a really profitable product in development that's going to get investors interested to drop a bunch of money. I mean, all that stuff is kind of the same, you know, phenomenon, just in wearing different clothes. You don't, you know, somebody um, sent me a video of, it was actually Penn and Teller, and it was one of the magicians who was smoking a cigarette and putting it out. And um, at the end, the other magician showed that actually he wasn't smoking a cigarette and he didn't put it, and everything you saw was an illusion. And um, and but what the point of the person who sent it to me was was, yeah, but people smoke cigarettes. So yeah, you, yeah. you don't fake something that's not real. Yeah. 
yeah. you fake something that actually is real that 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 happens and that's how you know you can you can trick people of course so i i think the idea that because somebody fake something therefore none of it's real it's just it's a non sequitur it just doesn't follow at all um it's sort of it's silly really yeah, it, yeah. It, but this is what i meant by these rhetorical moves that people make that are just um they're just beliefs really posing as as reason or as logic um, I wanted to end with Archives of the Impossible. Um, yeah. I know that you uh, have um, uh, formed this repository of amazing visionary um, writings and experiences. And the, can you talk a little bit about what's in the collection and then what the value of that is and how you hope that folks may be able to use it to sort of further this conversation? Yeah, I can do all of that. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate you asking about it. Yeah. Um, so first of all, the Archives of the Impossible is 15 uh, collections under an umbrella called Archives of the Impossible that I named after a book I wrote called Authors of the Impossible. And the, the premise of Authors of the Impossible is that the paranormal is essentially a kind of writing. This will feed into your literature training. That that um, if you actually listen to people's paranormal experiences, they take they take on a narrative or textual form. Um, and therefore, narrative and text can also take on paranormal qualities under the right circumstances. So it's a kind of it's a kind of dual argument. The archives of the impossible, of course, are fifteen collections filled with files and letters and case studies of these different phenomena. And by interacting with these physical objects, my assumption is is that the researchers will. Um, will be impacted and, and will be affected. Um, there's, we haven't counted them, James, but there's gotta be a, well over a million documents in there. Wow. Um, they're, they're immense. I, I have worked through a number of the collections, but just by work through, I mean, just going through box after box after box and just seeing what's there. Um, my over My overarching, overwhelming, conviction or conclusion is that it's vast yeah. and that there's no way uh, any single individual can get through it all the 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 collection started in 2014 with a with Jacques Vallée approaching me in Berkeley California and asking for help placing his own papers and files and letters in a, in a university archive we negotiated that for four years and and Jacques was our first donor. And then it was Whitley Strieber, and then it was Ed May with the Stargate project. And it, it sort of kept going. Our last, our, our last, and I don't mean our last, I just mean our most recent donation was the Johnny Mack collection. Yeah, the, yeah I saw that. Harvard Psychiatrist. And that's 150 boxes or 450 wow. linear feet of <laughs> case studies experiencers and records of all sorts so that's one collection james that just gives you a sense of the size of this thing and, and so i've used i've also used those archives as a physical base or hook to host a series of conferences called archives of the impossible and yeah. basically how these conferences work is i bring in other academics and experiencers and we have uh, a conference over two or three days at Rice University around these around these archives, and the idea is 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 to simply mainstream the topic inside the academy, yeah, and to uh, literally authorize um, a set of questions that people will take up over many generations, and the the beauty of an archive is it's not about me. It's not about Jacques. It's not about John. It's not about any of the donors. It's about the future. It's about other researchers coming to the archives over many generations. You know, the archives will last as long as the university lasts. Yeah. And, and so that to me is what's so attractive about it. It's not, it's not a personal thing. It's not a sense of self aggrandizement. It's a, it's a it's a kind of generativity of continuing the conversation, but in the context of the academy, 
and people who are asking really, really sharp, I think intense questions that that matter. And what we saw with the first two conferences, by the way, was uh, an overwhelming sense of enthusiasm and 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 well, just overarching enthusiasm. I mean, just to give you an idea, the university generally gets about 500 hits when it publishes or posts a lecture on, mm -hmm. on YouTube. We had 150,000 hits in two weeks. Yeah. And we had over 200 people in physical attendance during COVID. So people were coming literally from all over the world to be at this thing and they wanted to be there physically. Yeah. And my assumption is that will continue. And, you know, we we will continue to have that kind of enthusiasm and that kind of draw as we host more of these, you know, over the, over the next few years. And we're also collaborating with a lot of universities, Harvard and Johns Hopkins and Stanford and, uh, you know, you name it. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to, interact and collaborate with with other researchers who are interested in the same kinds of questions yeah. um, so that's that's the nature of the art the art the archives of the impossible is is, is actually what I do most of, for mo most of my days and most of my life right now I yeah. I really believe in it um I I think it's a oh, I, all the reasons I just stated I think it's incredibly powerful yeah it seems like it's establishing the framework for a field of study. Yeah. And that it's the data, um, yeah. you know, and as we get into the age of AI and all those sorts of things, there may be things that we can do with that information later on. Um, I, for one, have always thought, and other people have said this, like you said before, way better than me, but collecting people's experiences of all this. And even though most of those are, um, you know, personal experiences, um, there is a, a hermeneutics, hermeneutics that goes along with it or whatever, an interpretation that uh, may be... Uh, the symbology or something could find, you know, could produce ways of, uh, you know, grokking it for the whole society. So, so our first donor, Jacques Vallée, is a computer scientist. Yeah. And he did a PhD in AI and computer science in the late 60s. And he spent his whole life in AI and computer science. And he really approaches the UFO phenomena as a kind of information scientist um, um, phenomenon. Yeah. You know, it, it's really about a, a, a kind of, infra, it's a kind of internet search is, is what is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and, but we also know from talking to computer scientists that, you know, AI, you get you get out what you put in. And, sure. and of course, any AI that you run on this um, is going to be limited by how you define your search parameters and how you feed stuff into it. And, we know that, and but again, we have computer scientists, and we have you know really smart people. The other issue, well, there's a couple issues. One is money, <laughs> um, always, right? I mean, um, please, cons please consider don't 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 donating money. Yeah, where uh, should where should people go if they were gonna uh, they wanted to give? They should contact me directly, and, okay. and I'll, I'll put you in touch with. Our development office and we'll we, we'll talk about this it takes money and the reason it takes money is these documents have to be scanned they have to be anonymized and then they have to be run through some kind of ai and we're just beginning that process a lot of it's a moral or ethical issue that is determined by something called irb or the institutional review board at our university mm -hmm. and so we're doing this with all the integrity and with all the the bells and whistles that you can imagine, but it's a slow process and it's also an expensive process and it takes a long time and it takes a lot of money. Um, so, but that's, again, that's why I like the idea that it's in a university, James, is Absolutely. the university is a community wrapped around this thing. And if I, if I need help, I just go to media or I go to the legal council or I go to the physicist, I go to the computer science. I just go to wherever I need to go and ask for help and, yeah. and have help. Um, so I, I have nothing but confidence and, and enthusiasm for the university context. They really, really care about this and they, they encourage me to do it. Um, frankly, there's not, there's no pushback. There's no, there's no censorship.
which is itself a sea change, right? I mean, it, it seems like that that is something that could only well, have John, happened in the last 20 years, you know? John Mack, to, to just give you an example, I mean, John Mack, who's our last major donor, um, Harvard tried to fire him yeah. for pursuing this this exact these exact questions. And and that was in the 1990s. And I mean, they really tried. It went on for 18 months. It wasn't this minor, like little tangential thing from some provost office. No, this was a this was a trial that went on for 18 months and involved lawyers, and they were going to remove his tenure and and fire him. And um that just that just is unthinkable today. So I I I think it it really has changed. I think the 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 landscape has changed, the culture has changed, and the the stupid, stupid jokes about tinfoil hats and little green men, thankfully, those are largely in the past, and we can sort of move on to more serious inquiries that 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 are that the subject really deserves. Yeah. Well, I think we're at time. Um, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And um, like I said, tell your grandchild, thank you. <laughs> I see I see my text message dinging. So it, it must mean something. I'll have to go look what it is. But um, yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you, James. Thanks. Thanks for having me again. And I, um, I you know, we, we try, we, we try our best. And I, you're, what you're doing is important too. I mean, this, this whole conversation that we're having publicly is is the conversation yeah and we don't we don't know who's listening we don't know who's you know and and i i'm always surprised by people who who are listening and and who do contact um me me individually and and offer to help and i'm like okay let's do let's do this thing let's do yeah. it yeah um so well thank you very much sir